So thank you to Unsolicited Press for putting this together. And um, Claudia, I'm so excited to read with you. Congratulations on uh, your forthcoming collection. I got to read a snippet of it and it was fantastic. So I look forward to reading the whole thing. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read a chapter of the Ballad of Two Sisters and I don't think much setup is needed. Um, the, the novel is kind of told in stories from different characters' points of view. I'm gonna read a chapter from the point of view of Helen. And Helen, uh, I, guess, I guess you should know about Helen that of the two sisters, she is the one who struggles more. I would say, and um, and has had some trauma in her past that that kind of unfortunately um, shapes her future. So, this chapter is called Dolls. Despite the way she felt about men, Helen had wanted nothing more her whole life than to have a baby. To temper this desire, she used to collect dolls. Most of them were secondhand, their plastic arms stained and scratched, their generously lashed eyes prone to malfunction, and their clothes moth-bitten and discolored. She brought them home from garage sales or thrift stores, and many times, knowing her affection for them, people gifted them to her. She loved each and every one of them and treated each with the same care a mother would bestow upon a real infant. Throughout her girlhood, the dolls slept in dresser drawers or took turns slumbering in a small wooden cradle. Although she imagined the dolls slept when she slept, she often woke in the middle of the night to the ghost of a cry and walked to where the dolls were, trying to discern which one was in distress. She put a hand on their foreheads to check their temperatures or slipped her hand between their legs to feel whether they had soiled their diapers. Sometimes the process was arduous. She went back and forth between dolls, but could not determine which one needed her attention. Some night she made her decision arbitrarily or chose the newest in the collection to soothe, the doll who wasn't yet accustomed to its surroundings. He would pick it up and say hush, almost inaudibly, patting its back rhythmically until something in the doll and in herself quieted. If after that ritual of soothing, neither she nor the doll could sleep, she took to whispering nursery rhymes into its ear as her mother had done for her. There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid. Then if she were lucky, both she and the doll would feel the pull of tiredness and she could put it down and fall asleep sleep quickly. Some nights, however, the doll could not be soothed and she would have to hold it so tight against her body that its plastic limbs left marks on her skin. On those nights, her sleep was shallow. The smallest noise had the potential to rouse her and often did. She would wake with a racing heart and dry mouth, the doll now beside her, and reach out to it as mothers reach out to their newborns to make sure they still breathe. Those nights always came at the worst possible times, when she had a test the next day, when her parents were fighting, when the house felt off kilter, the foundation shifting beneath her. She kept up her habit of the dolls in secret long after girls her age had put their dolls away. But at 14, when she started menstruating, she finally relented and put all of them in the attic. After she began fantasizing about finding abandoned children, about babies in baskets left where only she would stumble upon them. She began fantasizing about becoming pregnant without being touched. She imagined immaculate conception, virgin birth. She would settle for a regular son. She needed no Christ. When her longing was at its peak, especially on nights when Stella was out past her curfew, or when her parents' fighting was brutal. She thought she could hear a baby crying and she would open the attic room door with trepidation and switch on the single bare bulb that lit the room. She would find the box with her name and dolls on it and open it to see all her discarded children there in various states of dress and disrepair. Innocent babes who had suffered through untampered heat and cold, innocent babes who in their abandonment cried for her. 
She would pick them up one by one and soothe each, running her fingers through their coarse hair, taking in their plastic and rubber effluvia. When she could no longer hear the crying, she put them in the box one by one and went back to sleep where she slept in fits of dream. Once she and Stella grew into women, the dream of having a child drifted further from reality for Helen, but not for Stella. Stella was the lucky sister. Stella had Gerald. Soon, certainly it would be soon, Helen knew that Stella would get pregnant, leaving her behind yet again. The whole business made Helen melancholy, desperate. At times, a physical manifestation of her desire for a baby would seize her. The muscles in her womb spasmed, and she grew weak with longing. It happened especially when she saw a child crying, its small arms reaching out for comfort for the safety of its mother. On a Thursday afternoon, Helen went into the city to shop for Christmas presents at Macy's on Michigan Avenue. As she walked past the men's shoe department, she saw a boy no more than two years old tottering through the displays. He had brown curly hair, rosy cheeks, and he wore a cheap looking winter coat, handmade mittens hanging from the strings from strings at the sleeves. He picked up one men's dress shoe, shook it in his tiny hand, and then placed it haphazardly back on the shelf. Pretending to look at a rack of suits, Helen watched him toddle through the shoes and then across the aisle, dodging the legs of adults who looked down and smiled. Now he meandered through dress shirts, the slacks, the sports coats. She waited for his mother, his father, his auntie, for someone to claim him. More time went by and no one came. Finally, the boy realized he was alone. Then it began a familiar noise, the whimper just before the cry of a child. A tremor passed through her body and she closed her eyes for a second, remembering that sound from when she was much younger, the sound her dolls had made from their cribs and the attic. Rubbing the fine fabric of a pair of dress pants, she thought of the dolls now. What had happened to them after she had abandoned them in her parents' attic when she moved out? She could remember it now, looking back at the box, neatly labeled and taped shut. Can I just leave this here? She had asked her mother. Of course, honey, her mother had said, even though her mother was already planning to leave Helen's father. But Helen couldn't have known then that in six months, her mother would be in a low rent apartment above a laundromat, living with only what she'd been able to pilfer from the house. It had been too late to go back for the dolls then but she never forgot about them. Sometimes she woke up and reached down by the side of her bed to see if one of her babies was there. Of course, it never was, so she curled back up under the blankets and held an extra pillow in her arms. As she tried to fall back asleep, she imagined her father finding the box in the attic. He would read the label and laugh to himself. Then he would rip the tape open and tear through the dolls mercilessly. This babe too long, this babe too short, this one's hair too matted, until each and every one of them lay scattered on the floor, cold and naked. Finally, he would kick them into cobwebbed corners of the attic. Mice would find their eyes, spiders would nest in their hair, and her children would be lost. The little boy's whimper grew into a wail, and she knew the only thing that could stop it was to touch the boy, to hold him, to keep him safe. Without thinking more, she walked over to him and scooped him up in her arms. He immediately fussed, but she pulled a chocolate out of her purse and gave it to him, distracting and quieting him momentarily. Where's your mom, she asked. Mama, he said. Is she here? Mama, he said, putting the chocolate in his mouth. Where is your mama? Mama, he said again, this time pointing a finger off toward the dressing room. Is your mama over there, Helen asked, pointing the same way. Mama, he said. Helen held him tightly as he squirmed and walked toward the dressing room. She waited for a moment until the saleswoman's back was turned and then walked in with the boy. Is your mama here, she asked, putting him on his feet and stepping back. The boy looked around and began to wail anew. No, shh, don't shh, she said, kneeling down to him. His whole face was red in misery. Is everything okay in here? A saleswoman suddenly behind her asked. I'm sorry, he just wandered in here and he's overtired, 
Helen said as though she were the boy's mother. Oh, poor little guy, be good for your mother, okay, buddy? The saleswoman said. Do you want a piece of candy? The clouds on the boy's face drifted as he stared at the saleswoman. Candy, the saleswoman said, pulling a mint out of her pocket. The boy took the candy. What's your name, buddy, she asked. Can you tell the nice lady your name, Helen said, which sounded motherly, she thought. The boy merely looked from her face to the saleswoman's face and then back again. What's your name, the saleswoman repeated. Still, the boy said nothing, and so panicked, Helen picked him up, which only incited him to resume crying. Bobby, Helen blurted out, it's Bobby. I have to get him home for his nap, she said. Thanks for the candy. Sure, the saleswoman said, no problem. Helen rushed out of the dressing room, afraid to be caught in her lie with the saleswoman looking on. Once outside of the dressing room with the boy in her arms, she did not know where to turn, for at any turn there could be the boy's mother or father or sister or brother, shattering Helen's dream of having him as her own. The only thing she could think to do was get out of the store as quickly and quietly as possible. Near the fragrance, she put her hand on the side of his head so that his face was obscured as he continued to wail. The girls at the counter smiled sympathetically. Of course, they didn't know who Helen was, who the boy was. The word kidnap rang in Helen's mind as she neared the door. Kidnap? No, not kidnap. That was what someone else might call it, but not really what it was. Kidnapping was a term assigned to a variety of differ, different situations, some of which could be justified once put into context, like this one. The little boy had no one, and she saw him, and he needed her. There had been no one else. When they finally reached the street, she put the boy down on his feet, and they started walking away from Michigan Avenue down East Pearson Street, where there was slightly less foot traffic. The boy was still crying, but his cries had thinned. She wondered if his allegiance was changing as it could so quickly in children of his age. She stopped and pulled him into the doorway of a closed shop. Stay here, she said, and then walked backward a few paces. It only took three steps before the wailing started again, and she went back to him and picked him up and pulled him toward her chest and hugged him tightly. It's all right, she said, it's all right, baby. Soon, in the warm confines of her embrace, his howl hushed. She did it one more time before she was satisfied, before she could fully feel the shift in him, which quieted something in her. After she stood there in the tiny alcove, holding the boy until finally he fell asleep and her arms grew tired. At least a half hour had passed. She imagined police would flood the store soon looking for him. That didn't give her much time to make the decision. Either she took him far away and did it now, or she found a way to take him back in the store. As she held the sleeping child, she felt she, she should be grateful for this time with him. It had been just the two of them and no one else. She had comforted, she had consoled. And so yes, for these halcyon moments, she had been a mother. I should have been your mother, she whispered in his ear. I would have been a good mother to you, she said. With that, it was time to take the boy back to where someone would find him. She walked toward Macy's and leaned around the corner, seeing a squad car out front. That entrance surely wouldn't do, so she found a different, smaller entrance on the other side of the store. It opened to the girls' section and was near another dressing room. When the saleswoman began helping a mother and daughter, Helen walked briskly into the dressing room with the boy. She went into the largest stall and lay him down on the small bench in the corner of it. His eyes flickered open and then closed again. Shh, she said, it's all right. She stood for a moment watching him, the child she should have had, and then rushed out of the store as he lay in wait for someone to come forth and carry him home. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, it's very exciting to meet everyone and to see familiar faces and to meet Summer and Darcy. And thank you everyone for tuning in. So um, as Darcy said, I grew up in Romania and um, I grew up behind the Iron Curtain and I immigrated to New York City in 1995. And uh, many of these poems, they're prose poems, 
are inspired by uh, uh, memories from my childhood, uh, nightmares, dreams. And um, if you get a chance to read the collection, um, I would actually propose to you to kind of uh, try to figure out if um, if what you're reading are um, things that really happen or if they're totally made up because um, that's what I was, that was actually something that I tried to do, to mix up, you know, things that really happened and things that I, I dreamed or I had a nightmare about or they're totally made up. So <clears throat> I'll get going with um, all was well in hell. Nothing to watch on TV but speeches. Large industrial plants manufactured wooden clocks, tin birds, and bells with no tongues. There was a three-year waiting list for a car without gas. We played outside all day with chalk and a ball. The key tied around my neck jumped up and down and printed a dark bruise on my chest. Lights off early in the entire cement city. Dear comrades, we know you need your beauty sleep. The tooth fairy was not allowed to fly behind the iron curtain. Instead, my brother and I were visited by an old toothless fairy. She limped into the room, stole the coins from the piggy bank and placed small potatoes under our pillows. There was an endless invention fair and we thought of the most amo amazing things, the suitcase that would carry itself with a small motor the thermo boots that would warm your souls in the deep winter freeze, the toaster that would make sausage as well and eggs sunny side up and arrange them into a smiley face on the plate. I love America, you said. When we'll go there with all these ideas, we'll be rich in no time. The tall glass of milk on the table had white teeth ready to bite, a fully equipped maxilla under that inoffensive surface. I was afraid to swallow it, afraid these teeth will grow into my mouth. Drink it, mom commanded. Milk is hard to find. If it bites you, bite it right back. History is written with gold letters, claimed the newspapers and the officials with cardboard mouths. History is written with shit, grandma said. She ripped the newspapers in these long strips to hang on a rusty nail at the outhouse. At attention, everyone was holding their breath. The generals were inspecting the troops again and they could send you to jail for a missing button. The great powers were picking their great long noses. We lived like this a few decades. The only stir was that of the ants carrying home whatever they could find from the fields. The bells had wooden tongs and so did the people. For the officials visit, they replaced the live ducks on the pond with decoys. The air was full of soda pigeons and the rivers of driftwood fish. Everyone spoke a wooden language. We wore the words on a string around our necks. Love was a small carved cross. Sadness, a wooden spoon. Love every day, said the fruit fly. The butterflies don't know what's written on their wings. The life is surprisingly short, ideogram. I can tell you all about the revolution of the flies. They stained the photo of the beloved leader in the newspaper that lined the table. Oh, the crowds, the spattering of sauce, the grease running across the printed page. In the kitchen, history was made. You can read it all in the stain on the wall. Only the mess survives. The caterpillars. The caterpillars kept me company. They lived in the two mulberry trees and munched on the leaves at night. I heard their crunch and rustle until they crawled into my dreams. In the collective, grandma, fed the mulberry leaves to the silkworms. Time was fuzzy and spun days of raw silk. Nights were cocoons. A furry flood, they climbed the walls. They covered the table and chairs with moving lace. 
The little girl crouched in a corner. She wanted to be a caterpillar too. Her only chance was to weave a cocoon and hang under the bed. The silkworms got sick and died in the summer. The caterpillars invaded the porch. The mulberry trees purple blood stained the dirt beneath them. My brother and I picked the sulken mulberries from the ground and ate them, then spoke with black tongues. Once instead of a mulberry, he swallowed a piece of black and glistening chicken shit. To this day, he feels very lucky. Luck is something you ingest or step into. Sometimes it's a beautiful woman wearing a flame dress and turning the corner. But most of the time, it's just a byproduct of pigeons. Make me lucky, mother, and throw me into the fire. And she did. There were no magic beans. There were no magic beans, but everyone had a magic beanstalk made of copper wire. It grew from the radio, curled around the radiator across the room, up to the ceiling and through the roof. Each day I climbed it all the way to Munich and West Berlin. Ich bin ein Berliner, said the handsome president. Yeah, we all were behind the tall walls where his speech never made it. It's easy to talk now, but what did you do then? I climbed the beanstalk and listened to rock music. Illegal stuff, you know, like hot, sticky, sweet ration sugar. I envied the polka dot crocodile who somehow managed to smuggle a request to the radio station and dedicated the song to his high school sweetheart, the princess with a heart of broken glass. At night, I used a dream sharpener. With a dream's pointed tip, I drew a window in the wall and escaped. Everyone wants to run away. Let's run away, love. Let's fly faster than the incoming storm. My back burns. The eyes of our chasers pierce holes in my side. Throw the hairbrush, love. Where it touches the ground, the woods will grow behind us and will hide. Let's run, love. Let's fly like demons set loose by a curse. My body hurts from the dog bites. Love, throw the knife behind us where it falls a mountain will rise and will escape let's run love let's fall into the deep together my hair is on fire and i hear our hunter's boots we'll, we're close to the border dear and the patrol has orders to shoot throw your scarf behind us love the danube will stretch as far as one can see the soldiers will sink into its hungry mouth and will be free. And um, the cast of characters, uh, one of, uh, I mean, again, uh, you can take a guess if they are real or not real, but um, here's Baba Marina. Baba Marina lived in our attic. When my fa our family moved, she moved with us. She'd throw a fit otherwise. When the old village moved in the new location, Baba Marina moved too. She didn't like to be by herself in the attic. One night when mother couldn't sleep, she got up and went to the kitchen and there was Baba Marina peeling potatoes and the eyes of the dead, throwing them into the boiling pot. In the morning, mother's hair was white as if she had walked through falling snow. Aunt Susie and the village. In the dead of winter, there wasn't much TV, much to do and no TV to watch. So I took up crocheting. I crocheted replicas of all the people in the village of Aunt Susie, old man Gheorghe, my, mother, my neighbor Lulu, my cousin Elena reading a crocheted book, the priest, the policeman, Baba Marina, the ghost from the cemetery, everyone. I crocheted their eyeglasses, headscarves, clothes, their cheeks and lips, their hair. I crocheted Aunt Susie's dog from brown fuzzy yarn and her flock of geese from feathery white and gray threads. And when Aunt Susie died, I crocheted her organs from bright red and brown silk and her skeleton complete with ivory teeth, floppy ribs and soft phalanges. I crocheted her brain 
ruffled and creased with all her cloudy yarn thoughts and convoluted synapses. I assemble her body on the dining room table, each organ nestled in a crinkly silk sack. The heart was the last one to go in, knotted and intricate with all the blood threads laced through the body. People said I had too much time on my hands, but what do they know? I told them, fate crochets us all the time with colorful threads. She links the day with the night, mother with child, spring with summer, with fall, with winter, and life with death. One loop, slip stitch, chain, turn, join two stitches, repeat. She drives her hook through my brother and me, and we both hang by a thread, then by another. Loop, stitch, chain, repeat. Faith has too much time on her hands. The Bone Music Maker. The Bone Music Maker is a bootlegger of jazz and rock and roll. His name is Sasha, and he lives on Resurrection Street. Each week, he looks for x-rays in the hospital dumpsters and takes them home to turn them into records. The hospitals are full of sick people. The dumpsters overflow with x-rays and band music is nowhere to be found. Sasha presses the music into the x-rays with a machine and cuts the discs with scissors. He burns a hole in the center with his cigarette and holds up the result to light. Elvis's Heartbreak Hotel on the ribs, Johnny Cash's I Walk the Line on metatarsals and phalanges, Miles Davis on pneumonia, Chuck Berry on the broken hip, Dizzy Gillespie on Uncle Misha's brain tumor, ready for the turntable for just one ruble. They sound like voices through torrential rain, ghosts singing through static, like music in fog light years away, piano and trumpets played by the bees. Ron Genizdat is criminal and everyone knows it, but students donate blood to get the money to buy bone music. Someone must have ratted on Sasha. One day, the Komsomol music patrol raided the apartment and confiscated everything, the piles of x-rays, the records still unsold, even the manicure scissors and the cigarettes he smoked and used to burn the record holes. Some say Sasha hid in the empty coffins waiting for Uncle Misha in the dining room. Others say he went to prison and another bone music maker took his place. In any case, on Resurrection Street, on skulls, vertebrae and femurs, the band bone music lives on and the bones shake, rattle and roll. The war horses. I want to tell you about the horses, how they galloped, pulling our wagon to the end of the world, from where we walked back, from where we went back, and how the hog whispered to the young trees, "Don't worry, you'll see much of the world go by, and still get your rings if you bend in the wind just a bit, a little." My grandfather liked horses and went to war with the logistic unit the lucky kitchen corporal. When the, fall, the front fell at Stalingrad, he ran out of the kitchen wearing only a shirt, but they didn't have room for him in the trunk. You can ride on the cannon, they said. 2000 miles, two weeks in February at minus 40 degrees, embracing the cannon lady for dear life. When they got to Romania, they pried him away from the metal flesh, stiff, teeth clenched, eyes swollen like beads. They sent him home to die. At home, Grandmother Stefana bathed him in oats and wrapped, him, wrapped his head in hot barley bandages. She boiled a horse feed and packed him in grain, a mummy in the darkest room of the house. She changed the gauze and fed him oatmeal with a teaspoon. She hummed a little song and whispered a prayer, Virgin Mary, Mother of God, bring back my man with, uh, with a white horse heart. Two months later, in spring, he opened his eyes. This is how we play this game. You tell me a story about a man and his horses, I tell you a story about another man and his horses. Through our veins, dark wine horses pull a wagon into the night. 
My other grandfather went to war on the Eastern Front with his own horses. 158,000 Romanians died in the field where the river Don elbows its way into Stalingrad. My grandfather was taken prisoner and sent to Siberia where only blizzard horses grazed. From there, he was sent to find to the West Front on the Red Army, um, up to the Tatra Mountains in Central Europe. At the end of the war, he came home on foot. All the horses were dead when he got to his village, so he bought a bicycle. A husband is like a horse, grandmother said. Give him good food, fresh water, and a handful of hay, and he'll always come home. On the battlefields of the world, the, world, the grass grows straight out of the bones beneath. The horses graze on the hair of the dead and look at me with thoughtful eyes. I hear their lips ripping the grass blades. The horses don't move. They only twitch their skin and swish their tails. After the armies leave, these are the sounds that history makes. The crunching, the chewing, the faint buzzing of the flies and the tails swishing them away. The Russian hat. Everyone had a Russian hat in Romania. I got mine at the flea market. It was expensive, oversized and soft with a silver sheen. There were people who said my hat was made of cat fur, that all Russians hat were, hats were, but I knew different. It was a skinned Russian bunny. I walked through Romanians with cold Romanian winters with a silver bunny curled on my head. From under it, you could only see my eyes. My headaches grew worse with each winter. It was the hat wrapped tightly around my head. It kept it warm, but it was heavy and squeezed my skull. I suspected it wanted to smother my thoughts in fur. I stopped wearing my Russian hat after I got to America. After it started bellowing Russian ballads long, loud enough to cover the noise on 34th Street. It was embarrassing. I sold it to Ursula for five bucks. Ursula was Swiss and looked very pretty in my Russian hat. She had a cat, Stanton, found on Stanton Street. On cold winter nights, the hat sang Russian army choir songs and Ursula drank vodka. Stanton, though, never learned to trust it. The way home. It was a strange, dilapidated city that looked a lot like Bucharest, but everyone spoke English. I was trying to find my way home, to find a subway entrance or a bus stop. You picked me up and drove me through rusty rail yards along mountains of dirt, mangled metal, and machinery parts. I was cold. You gave me your jacket and the poetry book about salamanders. I thought you wanted to save me, but you only wanted to teach me a lesson. Poetry doesn't save anyone, you said. It only messes with your head. Only in New York. The white rabbit rides a bike and stops at the traffic light. He wears black shorts printed with pursed red lips and drags behind him a sign for the penthouse bar at 250 Madison Avenue. In the sticky heat, I wonder if he has marmalade on skin under that fur. He looks at me and as if he knows something I don't and clinks the bell. Just like us, the objects long to be together. The neckties hang out in Brooks Brothers windows. There's a conference of umbrellas in Bryant Park, a summit of Russian hats in Brooklyn and a shoe party at my back door. Last night, I fell into the abyss again, and I wanted you to know how deep it was. So I, I counted the seconds, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, flying head down into the pit. When I got to 37, I knew I was too far to be saved. In Herald Square, the Statue of Liberty has lunch with a silver man. The copper robot tells them jokes from when he used to be golden. 
The statue complains her feet hurt from standing all day. I wonder if she lives on Staten Island and takes the ferry home. I imagine her lifting her skirt over puddles and nodding to the other lady in the harbor. I wonder if the silver man sleeps with a paint on or if he showers, how the paint runs off his face like mercury, traveling a strange, revealing a strange person in the mirror, how the bathroom glints in the moonlight and all the pipes shine silver inside as he reaches for the towel. The Tiny Comedy Club. I perform live in front of an audience of baby dolls and stuffed animals. They laughed so hard at my jokes that button eyes popped out and their side stitches split. Stuffing floated around the room like snowflakes. The beanie babies spilled their beans, and that's the tea. The whole city laughed, except for two pigeons in gray uniforms who flew above the comedy club. This is no laughing matter, they said, and shitted solemnly in the street. I'm gonna file a report with the Department of Truth. Someone's comedy club is another one's outhouse, I mumbled. Go ahead, report me, I yelled. It's a free stuffing toys country and the teddy bears are my witnesses. Times, the end of the world is near. Time to move to New Jersey. Mother and I walk through the woods and a woman with a twirling umbrella shows up, dressed as a clown from the Zamboni Circus. She's telling me a message, but I'm distracted by her umbrella and don't understand. A dog comes by and it's my little brother. I recognize his eyes, the way he looks at me. He's limping, so I carry him home. Giant fires light up the sky. We're on the highway near my hometown. The hills are burning. In Times Square, Jesus is eating pad thai for lunch and a bunch of Elmos are joining the armed forces. A recent transplant from the ninth circle of hell chats with an old lady in the subway. She can't hear anything because Spider-Man is playing, playing the saxophone. In the tunnel, someone detonates a teapot bomb by accident. Everyone runs but the sax player. In Bushwick, the local artist takes her peacock for a walk. The queen bee is walking tigers on Broadway on a golden leash. And my neighbor is walking a white dog nam named Noon and a black one named Midnight. He smokes and stops to pick up to them. He has a cat named Insomnia at home. At Starbucks, the latte costs 39 bucks. The barista is wearing a Putin t-shirt and a Karl Marx beard. He speaks with a strong Russian accent and writes Comrade Claudia on the cup. E.E. E. Cummings is eating a freedom omelet with freedom fries for breakfast. I pay for the ladder and sit at a table with Lord Byron. He's holding a toy bus in his hand and says, God bless you. The walls are covered with portraits of Justin Bieber and Beyonce. On the black and white TV, Wolf Blitzer announces that Beyonce had just won the presidential election. One should always ask at the end of the world, what would Beyonce do? She'd move the White House to New Jersey. And I'll close with, what happens in the poem stays in the poem. Take a dream vacation to your beautiful pain. Enjoy it, its five stars hotels, fine dining and dazzling nightlife. Find new romance under your heart's Eiffel Tower and play the penny slot machines. Slide your tokens inside the wounds and pull the handle until the three cherries align. Pound after pound of shiny poems will pour out. Don't delay, book your trip today. It will be the experience of a lifetime. Thank you so much.